Let's open with prayer tonight. I believe God for a powerful time in his word. And if somebody could shut that door for me, I really appreciate it. Lord, I thank you tonight as we come in agreement right now, all of us agreeing together. We thank you, Lord, for an open heaven that's here, your glory. Holy Spirit, as you move in power, and I thank you, Lord, for your presence here. And even now, as the Holy Spirit is moving upon every single one of us to give you our best ear, our full attention, our focus, that we will be good, fertile soil in our hearts and minds and lives for the Word of God. Lord, I thank you for it. And even now, the Holy Spirit to help us to get captivated, to give you our focus, that we're not going to be distracted by all these other things, but the Holy Spirit helps us and helps us understand things maybe we normally wouldn't or see things maybe we would, would not be able to see. But the Holy Spirit helps us. He's our teacher. And Lord, I thank you for good soul, and I thank you for speaking through me everything that needs to be said tonight, that everything will be said. It'll be said under the anointing. Lord, it will go forth and be heard. It'll be as living seed sown into good soil, watered by the Holy Spirit. Take root, grow, and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till Jesus comes. And I thank you for the winds of the Spirit blowing this out among the nations. It will get where it's supposed to and accomplish what it's supposed to because the Bible says it won't return void. But it will go forth and accomplish that which you sent it forth to do. And so we agree together as a church, anything trying to hinder this, we bind you in the name of Jesus. You will back off right now away from this. Everything will be accomplished. It's God's will to be done. We bind the enemy, and we thank you, Lord, for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm on part 14 tonight of keys to an effective prayer life, and we're going to go right into this if we could keep that shut i'd appreciate that and so we're going to go right into this tonight okay and i want to open up by saying that this is probably one of the most important sermons that you're going to hear in this series and not the only one but one of the most important and especially in the area of your safety and your protection so i want everybody please give me your best ear tonight and really let the lord speak to you because this is significant and I can't emphasize that enough because I think that in America, this is a real problem here. And I also think that this issue I'm preaching on tonight, people that have been rebellious and not really listened to the word in this area have had totally destroyed lives. How I many knows what I'm talking about when you know rebellious people? I'll tell a few stories as I go through this. I think should Lord uh, lead me to do so. But I've known people through the years that did not understand authority and it did not end well for them. So, let's look at what the Word says tonight in Hebrews 13, verse 7. This has a lot to do with us being effective in our prayer lives, okay? It says, remember those who rule over you, who have proclaimed to you the Word of God. Follow their faith, considering the, result, the results it has produced in their lives. And also, if you go from verse 7, skip down to Hebrews 13, 17, it says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they watch over your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do this with joy and not complaining, for that would not be profitable to you. And so like I've said before, the last couple weeks, we talked about turning impossible situations around. So we dealt with what? Putting a blessing on things. Speaking a blessing, putting a blessing on things. If you put a blessing on it, that blessing will turn an impossible situation around. Once you really understand the power of blessing and understand what it is and how to use that, if you know the way God intends scripturally, I'm telling you, it'll turn things around. Secondly, we talked about the courtroom. That'll turn things around. And thirdly, fasting. I talked about three things that'll turn impossible situations around. Well, tonight, I'm going to start an area that I'm going to talk about humility but humility will cause incredible things in your life, incredible things. But how many knows that if somebody is rebellious, first of all, they have a pride issue that leads to rebellion, okay? And so when you deal with humility, you're dealing with people that are humble enough to submit to and honor authority, okay? And so this has a lot to do with your prayer life because people that are prideful and rebellious and they don't understand authority and they have a wrong attitude toward authority trust me your prayers are hindered and your in fact your christian walk is hindered 
And so if you'll understand authority, you can come into an incredible prayer life that's very effective. So let me read this again. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they watch over your souls as those who must give an account. How many knows that pastors and leaders are going to give an account to God for the church that they pastor and the people they preach to and prayed for? Let them be able to do this with joy and not complaining. For that would not be profitable to you. I've talked to fellow pastors, and it's so sad sometimes I hear them. They're like, man, just the, the difficulty some of them have gone through, the, the lack of support some of them have. And, and I know that they're frustrated, and I try to give them some things God has shown me, just encourage them. But how many knows that it's to the benefit of the sheep that the pastors are doing well? Does that make sense? If the pastor is able to have a powerful prayer life and he's not all wounded and damaged by all the difficulties he's having to deal with, if he's able to really pray and get in the word and come in under the anointing, it's going to benefit you and your entire family. All right, then also Ephesians 4.11, God, Peter said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Now I'm going to talk about the fivefold ministry here. The mighty hand of God is the fivefold ministry, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And it says that he gave some to be those for the, what, the equipping of the saints, for the works of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all come into unity of the faith, faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a complete man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine or by trickery of men but by their craftiness and with deceitful scheming but speaking the truth in love we may grow up into him in all things who is the head Christ, Christ himself from whom the whole body is joined together connected by every joint and ligament and every part effectively does its work and grows, building itself up in love. So we're all seen as it collectively together as the body of Christ. But who's the head of the church? Christ. And he's given as the head of the church the fivefold ministry for the equipping of the saints to help bring unity of the faith, bring us to maturity, every ligament, every joint supplying, that everything is working together properly. But this is so that a church can be healthy and effective. But let me, I'm going to emphasize this a lot tonight, that God has invested his kingdom authority in the local church. I'm going to say this as tactfully as I can, but yes, there can be fellowships and, and people coming together. But if you go back and read the book of Acts, the Lord invested his kingdom authority in the local church. Does that make sense? And I know that, that there's, there's room for this, I guess, but denominations by and large, and I'm not picking on any one, but it's man-made. And it's full of problems because it is man-made. It's full of politics it's about who's got the biggest ministry. It's usually has, unfortunately, a lot to do with finances. You know, they cater to those with money. And it, sorry to have to be so blunt tonight, but that's just the way it is. And it's usually a popularity contest about who gets in charge of things. And you can see with what I just described why that thing would be full of problems. And it is. But God has invested his kingdom authority in the local church. And if the local church will be led by the Spirit and follow the headship of Christ and, and live scripturally, there can be incredible authority in that local church. Amen? All right. Acts chapter 3, or Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Whenever the apostles were talking about how they had to stay focused in the ministry, there was all these problems coming up about widows being overlooked in the daily distribution of some of the finances and the food that would go with it. There was like these problems. And Peter and the others said, look, we don't have the time to sit around and deal with all these things. So listen to what it says. Brothers, look among yourselves for seven men who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we can appoint over this duty. But we will give ourselves, this is our responsibility, fivefold ministry. You ready? We will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. That's what God wants us doing is focused in prayer and in our study time and then serving the local church. You know, if there's visiting people and praying with people and counseling here and there where it's needed. But God wants our primary focus to be in prayer and in the word. 
Because if we're in prayer and in the word, then we're able to come out with a fresh anointing and feed the sheep. How many knows that sheep need grass and they need water? So they've got to be taken care of. And people are hungry for that. All right, so let me read a few things I have in my notes tonight. Humility is the key to be under authority. It's also humility is the key to walking in wisdom. I'm going to do a sermon just on one of the most important things you can pray for is wisdom. And I'm going to do a whole sermon on that. And then thirdly, humility is the key to hearing from God. Think about what I just said. Humility is the key to being under authority, to walking in wisdom, and, for, and to hear from God. Because some people say, well, how does that apply to hearing from God? Because the Bible says God knows the proud man from afar. But he's close to the humble. God will speak to the humble. Humility and prayer and fasting are always seen together in Scripture. I don't want to go too fast. I want these things to kind of sink in tonight. Humility, prayer, and fasting are always seen together in Scripture. For you to pray and fast, first, you've got to humble yourself. Also, as I already quoted, God is close to the humble. He, gives, he also gives his grace to the humble. How many want God's grace? You know who does not have his grace? The arrogant people. God gives his grace to the humble. And also, if you read the Bible... You know what else God gives to the humble? Honor. If you want God's honor on your life, you want his grace on your life, and you want the nearness of God, walk in humility. If you want God to seem distant from you, you want to have a lack of grace in your life, and you want dishonor, walk in pride. I think this is what holds a lot of people back. Not, not that... In River of Life, we haven't had too many issues, but the issues we have had through the years have been pride and rebellion. But I think this is what hinders some people because you can look at some, and I'll, I'll give one story tonight. There was two siblings that used to come here. One of them was very humble and had a tender heart, and God would always touch that one. The other one, two siblings, same parents, same house the other one was prideful and rebellious and had an issue with authority and even though i saw times where the power of god would knock him down or something he never changed a bit he would get off the floor the same as he went down came to church here for years god really did a work in his brother but not really him it was him it was the pride and rebellion in him he never changed you know where he is right now tonight? In prison. See, some people have to learn about authority the hard way, but how many knows that we're going to learn about authority one way or the other? You can learn it at home when you grow up. I had good parents and good grandparents, and they disciplined us, and I learned authority as a kid. And then you go to some, something like a school or something, and you learn authority by submitting to the authorities there. But if you've got a real prideful, rebellious, annoying person that just won't, you know how they, sometimes they'll learn authority? It's when the cop is putting handcuffs on them. They'll learn authority then, won't they? They'll learn it when they're in prison and they've got to deal with the prison, uh, those that work the prison system. They'll learn authority. You're never going to be without authority in this life or the next. You're either going to learn it the easy way or you're going to learn it the hard way, but you will learn authority one way or another. All right, so when we're dealing with understanding authority, pride, let's look at something. I'm just going to read over some of these because I could stop and preach a whole sermon on some of these points. I really could, actually, but for the sake of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you information. You can go home and read these stories for yourself and kind of look over this and go deeper, okay? But pride is what led to Lucifer's rebellion out of heaven. 
If you read Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, and also Isaiah 14, 3 through 23, it makes it very clear. In Ezekiel, it talks about that pride, iniquity was found within you. You saw yourself as beautiful. That's the way Lucifer began to see himself. In Isaiah, he began to say, I will exalt myself above my peers, the other stars, and I will sit enthroned. Basically, he was saying on God's throne. I mean, how arrogant can you possibly be? And Satan tried to exalt himself to the highest place possible, and therefore God threw him all the way down to the lowest place. And in the very end, do you know where Lucifer is going to be? He's going to be in the lake of fire with every other rebel. Christ, on the other hand, was in the highest place, being God. But what did Christ do? He humbled himself all the way down to the lowest possible place of dying a criminal on the cross, even though he was innocent, and even down to the lower recesses of the earth when he went down there to get the keys. And because Christ humbled himself all the way down to the lowest place, guess where he is now? At the highest place possible, at the right hand of the Father. You'll see, God will exalt the humble, but he will bring the arrogant person down. He will bring them way down. We can either humble ourselves or we can be humbled. That's what Christ was saying when he was saying, you can fall yourself, you can fall upon the rock and be broken, or the rock can fall on you and crush you. That's what Christ was saying there. He was saying, you can humble yourself, or if you refuse to, God can humble you, but it's going to hurt. And when you look at Adam and Eve, what was the problem? Eve was deceived Adam wasn't but what was it they wanted to be like God Satan had deceived Eve and said no 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 God's trying to keep something good from you you can be like God there's that pride of life and it led to rebellion that they did the very thing God told them not to do and look at all the disaster that has followed since even in their next generation I mean it didn't take long they had two kids and one of them murdered the other. And then you see in the Bible Korah's rebellion in Numbers 16, 1 through 40. I'll talk about this later, but just to make the point, you know, that Aaron and Miriam, and they might have even had a little bit of a point here, but they were complaining about Moses, Marian, uh, Ethiopian, Cushite woman, and they were speaking against Moses. Now, that was their brother. In fact, Miriam was the older sister, probably when Mo Moses was younger, kind of looked after him. But they were trying to set him straight, you know. And God comes down, and he rebukes Aaron and Miriam to their face. But listen, Aaron and Miriam humbled themselves and repented. And God restored them. But Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they didn't repent. They were lifted up with pride and they began to rebel. They said, who does Moses think he is ruling over us? We also hear from God. We also can do these things. And they began to rebel against Moses. You know what God did? They never repented. So God caused the ground to open and swallow them and their families. And they, were all, they all perished. God destroyed every one of them. And let me just say this. The ground may not swallow you now, but God knows how to bring, if people are going to rebel and not stop, there will be a sense of some type of death that will come. Something. The Bible says pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. If people keep on in this pride and rebellion, I promise you it will bring destruction ultimately. And then, of course, King Saul's rebellion. God spoke to Saul to go destroy all the Amalekites. And we know the story. In fact, I've taught it in River of Life. We know the long a story all the way to the days of Esther that Haman was apparently an Agagite he was a descendant of that king so see Saul not doing what God told him caused all those years later there to be something where the children of Israel were almost destroyed that were in Susa they're in Persia and God had to use Esther who by the way was a direct descendant of Saul and it seems that the book of Esther indicates that Haman was a direct descendant of an Amalekite king. So if you don't obey God and deal with it in one generation, then it's going to end up being fought in a later generation. Does this make sense? 
But Saul, did, he rebelled. He did not do what God told him to do. And, but he was making excuses. This is the scary thing with some people. They're always full of excuses. Samuel shows up and says, did you do what, what I told you to do? And he said, well, yeah, I did everything, but I, I didn't kill the king and I, apparently some of his household and maybe even some others, but he just mentioned the king. And then he said, and I didn't kill all the animals. I kept the best ones and he tried to make it sound good. I kept the best ones to sacrifice to God. As if Israel didn't have any animals. And so Samuel's like, you didn't do what God told you to do. You rebelled. He says, rebellion is as witchcraft. And he said, let me tell you something. Because God can't trust you because you're a rebel, you've lost the kingship today. It's going to be torn from you and given to somebody better than you. And God raised up David. We know the story. If somebody's prideful and rebellious, they can lose out with God big time. God's response to Korah's rebellion was to bring destruction. But when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, God destroyed them, he destroyed the rebels. He also, that was the same story where God caused Aaron's, bud to, uh, Aaron's rod to bud. Do you remember that? He had a wood rod, and they laid it out with all the other rods, and Aaron's rod began to produce flowers on it. And so God showed this. I've seen this before, unfortunately. I've, I've lived to see it where people want to get lifted up with pride and get rebellious and they want to try to cause an uprising. And when the smoke clears, unfortunately, I've known people, and I say this with a heavy heart and I say this with love, but I've known some people through the years that I have no doubt in my mind that God had a call on their life. There's no doubt. They had an anointing and they had a call on their life and they probably, I believe, probably still do have a call on their life, but they're not in the ministry or doing anything with it they left in pride and rebellion and tried to cause problems and it's sad when I said there's kind of a death of some kind do you see what I'm saying that's sad because it's been many years and not only that but then what does God do God causes river of life to bud and blossom without them and there was one individual I remember seeing a vision God showed me somebody was speaking into his mind but I saw it look like black little watermelon seeds getting in his mind. Let me tell you something. Be careful what you're listening to. As this person was planting seeds in this individual's mind of rebellion. His personality started changing. He started going from being a humble person to a prideful person. He started saying and doing things that it shocked me that he would because he normally wouldn't have been that arrogant and rebellious. Next thing you know, he rebelled and took others with him. It's sad. But believe me, my story is, is no different than most every other church and every other minister has stories just like that. And we've seen it over and over again. Let me tell you something. If you, for whatever reason, feel, let me say it this way. Right now, I've been under, I understand authority. And I understand that authority is invested in the local church. So for many years, even going back before my wife and I were married, so that's over 20 years, there's one individual that I've always considered my pastor. And I've always been under him as a pastor, and I still call him, still go see him periodically. And I usually go like on a Wednesday night to his church, and, and we pray together, and I kind of update him on everything going on. But he's been like a pastor to me in a covering for years. I mean, and then also on top of that, I understand authority. And so I'm not going to be out here just doing this by myself. I was with John Davis and all that. And then, of course, he passed away. But I've moved over into a fellowship. And I really love and honor those that are in this fellowship. But I don't, I'm not going to be doing this by myself. And not only that, but I'm so thankful to still have my parents with me today. You know, because not everybody can say that. And I still bounce a lot of things off my dad. I'm almost 50 years old, but I'm just not stupid and think I know everything. And so I still bounce a lot of stuff off him, even though I don't have to, but I do because he's got so much wisdom. And I listen to what he tells me. And I also have some really close friends in the ministry. That you know, One of them is Brother Benny. I, he wouldn't mind me saying this. But usually if I have some things going on, I'll call some of my friends and be like, hey, what do you think about this, that, or the other? And they'll tell me and pray with me and all that but how many knows what I'm talking about you're not going to be prideful and rebellious 
you submit yourself to one another in love. You're, you're under authority. And it's been this way for a very long time. And so I don't understand some of the rebellion that's out there. And if for whatever reason somebody feels like, well, I just can't remain at this church, I understand that whatever church it is. So let's just say across the United States of America, somebody's going to a particular church. And they feel like for whatever reason there's irreconcilable differences or something that they feel like they have to leave. That's understandable because maybe they do need to leave. But I'll tell you how you leave. You leave quietly, not causing one problem. That's what you do. Amen? You don't try to, to tear down the pastor. You don't try to destroy the church. You don't try to turn people against each other. You don't try to turn people against the pastor. Just pray for them and leave quietly. And if at all possible, leave with their blessing. That's what you do. So what does the Bible say about rebellion? Well, rebellion is basically disobedience. I'm going to explain some things in a moment. But rebellion boils down to disobedience. There's times where I had to be under authority and I absolutely did not agree with the decision that was made. How many have ever felt that way? But I still went and did what they said. Does that make sense? Because even though I may not understand it, and there's been time, many times where I didn't understand it, I didn't agree with it, and I thought, dear Lord, and then after time passed, I kind of understood where they were coming from and why they made the decision later. And given the set of circumstances, I actually probably would have made the, that decision too, but I didn't know all the facts. See, a lot of people don't realize this in churches, and if they did, I think it would really change a lot of things. People don't realize that a lot of times the pastor and the leaders know a lot of information that the common people don't know. And therefore, they make decisions based on information that they cannot get up and air to everybody. And so people don't always understand the decisions. But rebellion boils down to disobedience and witchcraft is basically ungodly control. And so... Derek Prince always taught this. I'll never forget this, and I don't think you will either. He said, there is a spirit of rebellion, and there is a spirit of witchcraft. There are two different spirits, but they're like two evil twin sisters that are always seen close by. If the spirit of rebellion manifests, there's no doubt that witchcraft will be lurking in the shadows and coming up also. If you're dealing with witchcraft, there's no doubt that the spirit of rebellion will also be lurking nearby. They always are somehow seen together, and it's scriptural because Samuel the prophet said that rebellion is as what? Witchcraft. And so just remember that. But the two great issues, now everybody please get this, is I'm saying some real heavy information, but I'm going through it quickly. But the two great issues of the universe are these two things. You ready? The greatest two issues when you're born into this world and all of creation boil down to number one, that we're willing to accept God's salvation through Jesus Christ. That's number one. You want know number two is that, that we're willing to obey God's authority. His word that we obey him. Did y'all catch that? The two greatest things that we can ever learn when we're born and we're walking through this life is number one, that we accept God's salvation and not rebel against that by trying to find another way. We accept it. Number two, that we come up under his authority and we obey what? His word. And I would add also a number three, that we love God with all of our hearts and that we love people. But the two first issues before that is that we accept his salvation and we obey his authority. All right. So where does all this really come from? I can't teach on this, but we all know we have an inner spirit and we have a physical body, but we also have a soul. Your soul area, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you dwell in a body. Your soul area is your, like your mind and your emotions and your will, but like in the realm of your mind, that's your intellect. So when you read and understand things mentally and your imagination, your memory, but in that realm of intellect, 
Then you have your emotions. And this kind of makes up your personality, who you are, what makes you laugh. It, it also is like a computer, if you will, and all the information you've learned through the years is stored in your soul. But here's a part of your will, I mean, a part of your soul. It's your will. You know what that is? The part of you that makes decisions. And so that part of you that makes decisions, that's the part of you that is either going to submit to authority or rebel against authority. We have to, to surrender this area of our lives to God. Our will is the part of us. I hope you don't miss this tonight because this is one of the more important things I'm saying. This is why I don't agree with a lot of the hyper-Calvinism that's out there that tries to take away the free will of people. Because it is God has invested in all of us a free will. God put in the angels in heaven. He gave them a free will and a third of them rebelled and left him and forsook him. God gave Adam and Eve a free will and they chose to rebel. And God has given from Adam till now every human being a free will. He offers salvation to the entire world, but we have a free will to accept it. And God never takes away our free will. So we have to surrender our will to God. Our will is the part of us that we will either rebel against authority or we will submit to authority because it's a decision that we make to do so. So rebellion starts in our hearts where the way that we think. Just like I saw a vision of that young man one time where his mind had like watermelon seeds in it. It was thoughts that were put in his mind that were rebellious. And instead of him renewing his mind and dismissing those thoughts, he began to entertain those thoughts and get those thoughts down in his heart. So everybody look this way and listen to me. Rebellion is rooted in our free will. It's a decision. Either we're going to submit or we're not going to. Where does rebellion really come from? It starts in our thought processes and gets in our hearts that we're thinking rebelliously. Then out of the abundance of the heart, people begin to speak rebelliously. Is this making sense? So it starts on what we're dwelling on in our minds. Then it comes out of our mouths. And then eventually we will make decisions that are prideful and rebellious. Does everybody understand? I'm saying something I could preach a whole sermon on just that right there, but I'm trying to go through it quickly. We have to surrender our will to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and submit to authority, even though we don't always understand everything. How many have ever felt God wanted you to do something or whatever, but you really did not completely understand why? How many have read the Bible and you know that God, when you were young in the Lord, you knew God told you to do something or not do something, but at first, because you were a baby Christian, you didn't really understand why. You know what I'm talking about. So rebellion starts in that realm of the mind, it comes out of the mouth, and eventually it will come forth in actions. You can hear pride and rebellion in the mouth of people. If you ever notice that certain people that are prideful, you'll try to talk to them and what do they say? I know. I already know. Arrogant. You know what? You don't know everything. Amen? And then when you're dealing with rebellious people, what do they always say? They're always questioning why. Why do I have to do this? When you hear that out of the mouths of people, I know. Well, why? That's a manifestation of pride and rebellion. You better watch out for those people in the church because usually those type of people are a problem waiting to happen, Pastor. Don't put them in a place where they can lead others astray. You know what the three greatest hindrances in your Christian walk are? Number one is unforgiveness. Number two is unrepentant sin in your life. But number three is pride and rebellion. I believe with all my heart, everybody please hear me tonight, Pride and rebellion is why some people can go to church for years and never change a bit. Right there. It's like it hinders them from ever really truly changing and growing spiritually. And consequently, 
I've seen people where they finally let God do in them whatever he needs to do to get that pridefulness out of them, that rebellion and their hearts to, to be submissive to authority. And I have seen where they actually start growing spiritually. Everybody just hear that. Once they finally resolve within themselves to be under authority, submit to authority, be humble, then they begin to really grow spiritually in a powerful way. So what about spiritual coverings? We're living in a world right now. We're behind enemy lines. There's princes and powers and wickedness in heavenly realms. There's spiritual battlegrounds in the heavens that are far beyond us. Okay, they are so far beyond uh, our little person, our little churches, our little ministries. I mean, there's this massive battle that's going on in the heavens. With that said, this clash going on between powerful angels, good and evil, we need to avail ourselves with the protection that God has given us. You know what that protection is? Primarily, it is coming under the authority of the local church. In fact, the Apostle Paul gave an example in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He was using something of that day when he was talking about head coverings. And he was talking about a woman having longer hair and having her head covered he was trying to help people understand that just like in the culture of that day, that it was important that a female be undercover. He was trying to say, look, you're the bride of Christ. You need a covering over you. He was trying to use an allegory of something of that time to help us understand. And he even said at the end of that chapter, he even said that because of the angels, it's important that a woman have a sign of authority on her head. Think about that. What angels is he talking about? And 1 Corinthians chapter 5 shows us that there was a man that had gotten in sexual immorality. And so Paul was saying, I've already passed judgment. When God is present among you, give him over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. Now, how did they do that? Practically, what did that mean? What that meant was that they simply disfellowshipped him out of the church. So you know what? He was out from under the covering of the church. He was open to the destruction of the enemy. Do y'all see what I'm saying here? So for us to be protected from all that's out there, we need that covering of a good local church that prays in a powerful place. And I understand in the day that we're living, you might have to drive a little bit of a distance to find a good local church compared to the way it used to be, but that does not excuse that we're out of church. In fact, the Bible is very clear. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the manner of doing. And the apostle Paul lived this out himself. Paul submitted himself in his early days before he was even launched out as an apostle. He went to the church at Antioch and he and Barnabas submitted themselves to that local church. And they were there. They were there praying and fasting. The Bible talked about them being prophets and teachers there. And I'm sure Paul and Barnabas were among them. But as they prayed and they fasted and they sought God and they were under that covering, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And the Holy Spirit said to the local church, set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. The leaders, the elders of the church laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them out. That's how their ministry started. Do you see how Paul understood the authority in the local church? Paul could have been out somewhere alone by himself doing his own thing, thinking, I'm a great apostle. Why do I need to go to a church? Why do I need to have a pastor over me? Why do I need to have these elders lay hands and confirm my ministry? He could have thought to himself, I can do whatever I want to do. But see, he would have been prideful and rebellious. He didn't do that. He submitted himself to the local church. And even the people of the early church in Jerusalem, when they all these uh, all these people started getting saved. All these Gentiles were getting saved. They didn't really know what to do with that because at that point, everything had been so Jewish. And so they, they had to, what? They went to the local church in Jerusalem, 
of which James seemed to be like the head elder. He was the brother of Jesus. He seemed to be the head elder. And they consulted the Holy Spirit. They prayed, and finally, after everything had been talked about, James said, well, this is what seems good that we do. And he made a decision as the head elder, kind of as the pastor, if you will. They were all in agreement, and they made a decision about what to require of the Gentiles. Is this making sense tonight? And I remember that I never forgot this because I was reading something Derek Prince wrote kind of along these specific lines one time. In Derek Prince's ministry, for those that aren't familiar, he would go out and he had an itinerant ministry. And God would really use him when he would go out and speak. A lot of times he would come into direct confrontation with demon powers because as he ministered, people would start getting delivered from demonic spirits even, even at the end of his sermons. And also healings would take place, which is a destruction many times of the enemy's works. And so he knew. He was talking about this. He said, I knew for me to go out and do what I was doing. He said, I always had a pastor over me. I always was under authority of a local church. And I would have that pastor and elders lay hands and pray over me. And I would go out that way to minister. Because he was smart enough to know he needed that covering over him if he was going to be directly confronting the enemy like that. So the church submits itself to the lordship of Jesus Christ, amen, and the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. The church is not a democracy. How many knows that whenever the church has tried to be in, like an American democracy, it's caused nothing but problems? The leadership says, well, we're going to go do this or the other, but now let's all take a vote on it. You know how many problems have come just from that one issue right there. What they need to do is pray and let the, let the leadership hear from God and do what God says. And I can't imagine praying about it and hearing from God and then getting up here saying, well, I really feel like God spoke to me this, but let's all vote on it and see if we're actually going to do it. <laughs> so the church is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. Christ is the head of the church. So by submitting to a local church, you're submitting to the headship of Christ. The centurion understood authority and it impressed Jesus. How many remember that? Because Jesus, you won't see somebody that was a powerful man that walked in authority and power like no other, Jesus Christ. Yet, Jesus was so humble, the same guy that would make a whip and drive out the money changers, the same guy that would openly rebuke the Pharisees in front of everybody was the same humble person that would say, whatever I see the Father doing, I do it. Whatever I hear him speaking, I speak. That's what I do. Totally humble and completely submitted to authority. There was zero rebellion in Christ. Jesus just simply did not come under the control of the religious leaders of that day. He stayed under the true authority of his father. Now, with that said, the centurion, who was a military guy, let me just say a quick little rabbit trail. You know, there was a great revival that happened from 95 to 2000 in our nation in Pensacola. And the evangelist said something I'll never forget. He said, do you want to know why? I, he said his opinion, the reason why God chose that area. He said, because... This area is a military town. And he said, many of the people in this church have a military background or military family, and they understand authority. And they understand submitting to the leadership of this church. Think about that for a minute. That really stayed with me. But the centurion came to Jesus. And if I could paraphrase the story, the centurion came up to Jesus. And I'm, of course, I'm just going to, paraphrase this in my own words but jesus said i'll come with you and i could see the centurion saying well lord i don't jewish people aren't supposed to come eat with the gentiles i'm not worthy that you come to my house or anything like that but he said i see that you're a man of authority that you take your orders from above 
And therefore, I see authority in you. Whatever you say, it'll happen. He said, I recognize it because I myself have superiors over me that tell me what to do. And I say, yes, sir, and I just do what I'm told. And therefore, I have people under my authority. I tell them, you go do this and go do that. And they say, yes, sir, and they do what they're told. He said, I see that in you, that you're actually under some type of heavenly authority. And if you just say the word, it'll happen just as you say. And Jesus said, whoa, I haven't seen this type of faith anywhere in Israel because he understood, understood authority. Jesus has given the keys to the kingdom, what? To the church. Whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. We have incredible authority in the local church. I don't think that any of us in the local church really truly understand the level of a threat that we can be to Satan's kingdom if we'll unify and know who we are and what we have in Christ and we'll become a people of prayer and we really unify and pray. I don't think any of us, why do you think Satan invests so much time destroying the local church and keeping it divided? So the fivefold ministry is God's hand. If we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, God will raise us up in due season. The local church, it's through the local church that we see the baptisms. There seems to be, in my opinion, three different baptisms. The first being a salvation, that you're baptized into the body of Christ. It's a new birth. The second, it's not a denomination. How many knows you're not baptized into a church or a denomination? You're baptized into the body of Christ. Second baptism seems to be a water baptism. And they used to argue in the early church, well, I was baptized by Paul, or I was baptized by Apollos, or I was baptized by so-and-so. And Paul says, none of that matters, okay? You were baptized in the name of Christ. So after you're saved, the second baptism is water baptism. And then the third baptism is the baptism into the Holy Ghost and fire. In Matthew 3, 11, John said, Jesus will come and baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. How many have experienced that baptism? But there was a pattern laid out in the Exodus. You know how the, the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, Pharaoh was a type of Satan, the taskmaster's demon powers. Egypt was like the world. It was time for God's people to come out under the jurisdiction of Satan and the world. And how were they saved? They were brought out by the blood of the Lamb, baptism number one. They were baptized through the Red Sea, baptism number two. Not only the sea, but what? The cloud, baptism number three in the Holy Ghost. It was a picture and type of what was to come. God is invested in the local church. We use the word sacraments. How many knows that this, this is important that I say this. We better never give up our authority to the government. It is not the government's place to tell us how to baptize people, who to baptize or not to baptize. In the same way, the sacrament, not only of baptism, but administering communion. The church has the right to administer communion and to exclude certain people that have no business taking it with us. Is this making sense? We have the sacrament of anointing people with oil and praying for them. We have the sacrament of marrying people. We better never give up that authority to the government and let them tell us who we can marry. Are y'all hearing me? And ordaining ministers. It's not the government's job to ordain ministers. That comes out of the local church. And they can scoff all they want. It doesn't make any difference. One day, their little arrogant selves are going to be bowing before Jesus Christ just like everybody else. But let me tell you how it works. God has invested his authority in the local church, not the secular government. It's not the government's place to be telling us who we can baptize or how we can minister communion or who we're going to marry. Amen? And also the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been given in operation where? In the local church. And God's given us nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Three are vocal, tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. You know, we can all that are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have a prayer language. But whenever God's used me to give a message in tongues, it's always been very different than my prayer language. It'll have a beginning and an ending, and then it requires an interpretation. The gift of interpreting might be the same gift 
that somebody like Daniel operated in when he had the gift of being able to interpret also dreams. It might be a similar gifting, couldn't it be? But it's the ability by God to interpret an unknown tongue. And then thirdly, prophecy, which is not just predicting the future. It's inspired speech. It's where God is speaking through you, an imperfect vessel. And God may give a word that may actually encourage somebody or may rebuke somebody or may expose a sin or it may expose what Satan is up to. The other three are the revelation gifts, words of knowledge where you get information you shouldn't know, words of wisdom, discerning of spirits. We need these gifts. The discerning of spirits is to know if it's of God or not. We need that gift, but it's the most misunderstood and probably disrespected in the church. But the words of knowledge I'll come back to, and then you have the power gifts. The, the gift of faith is the ability at a given time to believe God in a way you never could on your own. It's a gift of faith. When it's time to pray about something, the gift of faith kicks in and you have no doubt it's going to happen. And then the gift of healing. You pray for somebody that has that gifting, prays for people and they're healed. Healing is usually progressive. You pray for them and they start getting better from that point. And thirdly, the working of miracles. This is instantaneous. For example, you, Jesus prayed over the food, blessed it, and it multiplied. Remember that? Or you're praying for somebody and their blind eye pops open right then. That's a miracle, okay? Or a leg grows out or something like that. But many times, gifts go together. For example, the word of knowledge and healing many times go together because somebody will be ministering and say there's somebody here that's got pain in your left knee and God's healing you see that word of knowledge and healing together thus the scripture is fulfilled he sends his word and heals you many times faith and the working of miracles go together because it takes supernatural faith to see those type of miracles number three many times discerning of spirits and the deliverance ministry go together you know why? Because when you minister deliverance, God will show you what you're dealing with directly and you can call out a specific spirit by, by its function or whatever. So God couples gifts together many times. But where are the gifts in operation? They're in operation in the local church and through the local church, out even into the streets. But it's a function of the body of Christ. That's why if you read 1 Corinthians 12, he says, does the eye say to the foot, I don't need you? He's talking about we're all one body and we all have a diversity of giftings and we have to work together. But put the emphasis on what? The body, the local church. So if we've had an issue with pride and rebellion, please repent of that and let God soften your heart. Don't remain like that and end up never changing. I've seen people be in church for years, never change, and once they get out on their own, they fall flat on their face spiritually. They have all kinds of spiritual problems, and it doesn't end well for them. They usually end up in a mess. The wrong type of marriage, the wrong type of situation, the wrong type of friends, and the wrong type of uh, path in life. I mean, they just go down the wrong path because pride and rebellion dictated that course. And somebody that's prideful and rebellious won't listen. Even if you tell them, they're going to go out and do the opposite. How many knows what I'm talking about? Now, let me say a few more things, and I'm going to close now with this. Satan is the great rebel. Please hear what I'm saying. This is a big warning. Rebellious people belong to him, and God is not going to allow rebels into his heaven. Did everybody just hear what I said? He's already kicked out a third of the angels. He's already dealt with rebellion in the garden. Many of them are ousted out from local church fellowships. And I'm just telling you, Satan is the great rebel. Rebellious people belong to him. And God is not going to allow a bunch of rebels back into his heaven in the end. In fact, if you read the book of Revelation, Jesus reigns for a thousand years, and believe it or not, the end of the thousand years, can you believe this? How many have read this? 
Satan's loose for a short time. What does he do? He gathers up a bunch of rebels. The Bible says as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And these group of imbeciles followed the devil to Jerusalem to try to overthrow Jesus in a great rebellion. And Jesus calls down fire from heaven and fries every one of them. That's how God views rebels right there. It's like a final cleansing before the Father comes. You think about it, people think, oh, in the millennial reign of Christ, oh, this is going to be so awesome. Jesus is here, man. He's going to be here. But what you have to understand is, is not everybody likes authority figures. Not everybody's going to like Jesus. You may not think that I'm telling you the truth. Then why at the end of the thousand years is there a great rebellion against him? In Ephesians 5, I say this many times, in Ephesians 6, we learn about spiritual authority and spiritual warfare. We're facing wickedness in the heavenlies, princes and powers, and he gives us the armor. But in Ephesians 5, the chapter before that, he says, now listen, husbands be the head of your home, wives submit, children obey. What Paul's trying to say is before you get into spiritual warfare, you better make sure that you're under authority and that your home's in order. Because if you're in rebellion and then you go try to fight Satan who's the great rebel, you're going to get slammed. And kids have to learn to be submissive to authority while growing up. Amen? Or they're going to have horrible problems in life. How many people have not been able to hold down jobs because they're rebellious and annoying? How many people have had all kinds of problems in relationships because of pride and rebellion? How many of you had a difficult one that you raised and you had to get rebellion out of them? I was probably one of the difficult ones. My parents were looking at me, yep. <laughs> well, that's probably true. But they, but they raised us right. And me and my brothers, I think, I think one of my brothers was like, Dad was talking to him about us not being really overly difficult. But one of them was saying, well... We were afraid to do too much, you know. As I remember, you know what I'm talking about. I'll tell you the first story, actually. When I was a little kid, I, I would guess, you might tell me, I was probably Amberly's age. I was probably around five or something, four or five. And I remember that my mother was telling me, don't play with the scissors, okay? It's a good mom, right? And so, of course, I went in there and played with the scissors. Do you remember this story? And I cut myself. And I remember she's over there bandaging me up. And I'll never forget this. I was a little bitty kid, but I remember this. She was like, this is why I told you, don't play with the scissors. And I'm sitting there with blood all over my hand. And that was my first lesson in not being rebellious and how I needed to listen to people. You see? And I never forgot that. And I also remember when me and my brothers would get annoying and we wouldn't listen. I remember mom would be like, I've had enough. And when dad gets home, you're going to get it. And we knew, man, it was like a sense of dread, but he, he's, when he gets home. But dad dealt with it. Let me tell you a kind of a funny story. There was a friend of ours that drives a school bus for a living. And um, anyway, so there was this kid that kept giving him problems on the bus. This is a good parent. Are y'all ready? And so the guy kept having to deal with him and was reporting him. He was really being an annoying, rebellious kid. And one day it got back to the dad. And the dad comes on the bus and says, I hear that my son, and he said he saw the dad coming, and he looked like a bodybuilder. He was a big old guy, and he thought, dear God, what am I going to have to deal with? You know, this guy, this guy is like standing there at the door, knocking on the door, right? And so he opens the door. Can I help you, sir? I hear my, my son's been giving you a hard time. And he's like, yes, sir, he has. And he's thinking, here we go. I'm about to get into it with this guy, you know. This guy goes in there and picks his kid up by the backpack. True story. Am I telling the truth? Takes him off the bus, says, you won't know more. Disappears. Next day, <laughs> the, kid, the kid gets on the bus. Humble, man. Humble. Gets on the bus, goes and sits down. Never gave the guy an ounce of problem the rest of the school year. How many knows if that guy ever sees this sermon, you are a good father. And I mean that. You're a good father. Amen. All right. Like I've said before, we're going to have to learn authority one way or the other. We're either going to learn it the easy way or the hard way, but we're going to learn it. And you can never be entrusted with, as John Davis always told me, you can never really have authority 
unless you can submit to authority. God will never trust you with authority unless you can come under authority. And I said before, Miriam and Aaron made a mistake speaking against Moses. You have to understand, that was their little brother. But God still took offense to it and rebuked them. And they repented, though, and they were restored. Let's humble ourselves in prayer and ask God, if we have an attitude toward authority that's not right, forgive us. Or we repent, change our hearts, put in us a humble heart that we can grow spiritually. The final thoughts are this. Because I'm talking about keys to an effective prayer life. If our prayer lives are going to be powerful and effective, we're going to have to be under authority because you're not out there on your own. You know, you may be praying at home and you're, it's your personal prayer life, but you have to understand something. You're a part of a local fellowship and we're also all praying at home and God looks down and sees us all kind of collectively together. And I think about in our ministry, the Watchmen program, somebody's praying and fasting one day a week, so every day's covered, but how many knows that we're all in agreement in this? So you may be praying alone, but you're not. And I think about when we come together at church and we all pray on Tuesday nights with these powerful prayer meetings. We're all unified and we're under authority together. Now think about our church services. That we're all in unity and we're under authority together and it's powerful. You know, whenever I go minister places, I always re recognize and respect whatever the, the pastor wants in that church. You know, if they want things a certain way, that's just the way it's going to be. Because they're the one that the buck stops there. When I go minister places, I go there humbly and under authority. But for us to really be protected and victorious in spiritual warfare, we've got to be undercover. How many are familiar with Watchman Nee's famous book on spiritual, uh, I think it's spiritual authority or submission to authority or something? That book was used in local churches for years to teach on authority. And then later, John Bevere wrote an amazing book called Undercover that's also been used in local churches to teach about authority, okay? But those two books, if, you, if you're interested in really learning more about this, I would recommend Watchman Nee's book on spiritual authority and John Bevere's book, Undercover. They will help you understand this. And maybe that you can walk more fully in it and teach others. But how many understand what I'm saying right now? This is not a small issue. This is actually a very major serious thing that can bring great destruction on people's lives if they don't understand it. You can open yourself up to horrible destruction by getting full of pride and rebelling. And so I say this with love and humility today before everybody please Please pray about this issue in your life and make sure that you're under a good authority because you're going to need it in these last days. How many knows that warfare is amping up before Jesus comes? Satan knows his time is getting short. He knows it. And there's a lot of spiritual warfare and we've got to be under authority, okay? All right, so Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. I thank you, Lord, for uh, moving in people's lives in a powerful way, helping us to really be under authority. It's an issue of our will. Just like a horse. You guys ever seen a show where you had to break a stubborn horse that they, they got that was wild? That horse is pretty much worthless until it's broke. You know what's breaking? The stubborn will. And until God can break that stubborn will... Lord, help us that in the area of our will that we humble ourselves and submit to authority, that we can do what we're told, we can respect authority and honor authority and be under authority so that we can be useful for the master, that the Lord can use us in an awesome way. Lord, we thank you for this word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.